Good evening. It's good to be here this evening, this Tuesday, October the 6th, is it? Is that what today is? I believe that is the date that we marked on the calendar for our friend Steve Gregg to come and share with us tonight. So I, I won't say a whole lot because I want to give all the time uh, to Steve, but Steve, when you come up, if you want to share a little bit uh, about uh, what you've been doing with the book and whatever the Lord's laid on your heart before you get into content, take a few minutes for that. Uh, but uh, we're excited that Steve is going to be here speaking about the kingdom of God tonight. Now, um, I do want you both in-house and those of you that may be watching us online to listen and think about questions or thoughts that you would like to ask Steve, after his, his lecture or his teaching uh, tonight on the kingdom of God, we will have an open Q&A. Now, with that, it's going to be open for uh, the content, the kingdom of God. I hope we do have thoughts or questions about that that uh, we can uh, throw at Steve, but also it will be a general open uh, Q&A. So if you just have any general Bible questions and you want to take advantage of someone that's been in the Word for a long time and have taught through the Bible. Uh, Steve would not consider himself the final authority on anything, but uh, there's wisdom in, in the Word of God. And if you spend enough time, you might accidentally come across some of it, right, Steve? And so uh, I'm excited for the, the Q&A. So please be thinking of something uh, from the content or things that, that you may just want to talk about or have questions about. Uh, I'll just say one final uh, thing about the Q&A. Just remember, it, it's not so much an opportunity to come up and say, I'm actually going to disguise a question with a little mini sermon and make my point and then hide a question at the end and make it look legit. Let's just really honor the uh, time of Q&A uh, in that way. So as uh, Steve is making his way up here, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to tell you that we love you, and Lord, even in this time, in this moment, as we stand in a pulpit made by human hands, the calling to teach and preach and share your word is greater than what man has created. But we ask that you would honor this time and this place as an opportunity for you to speak to our hearts. I pray that we would honor it in such a way and that we would open up our hearts and, and our minds to receive truth. We pray that you would touch your servant, your son, Steve. And Father, Lord, with the great love that you've already bestowed upon him, with that great love, pour out your anointing on him to uh, shine the light of your word in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Well, I guess you mentioned me uh, saying a few words about the book. I don't sell books, but I've written a few books. Um, you can't buy them from me because I don't sell them, but you can buy them from other places if you want to, like Amazon and places like that. I have written a few books, not very many for the years I've been in ministry. Uh, I've been in ministry for 50 years this year. Uh, I started in 1970, and it's exactly 50 years since I've been in the ministry in that time, I've not written very many books, altogether five. One that was a little tiny book I wrote back in 1976. Then there's two books that are still in print, uh, and one of them is about the book of Revelation. One's about the hell. But recently, uh, just really at the end of last year, when I was here last December, I had a plan that in 2020 I would take, oh, maybe three months off from travel and to write a book about the kingdom of God. That's the subject I'll be talking about today, but uh, the kingdom of God is a subject I've taught about since about 1974. Now, I've been teaching since 1970, but from 1970 to 74, I don't think I knew enough about the kingdom of God to make sense of it enough to teach on it. But I'd been a Christian most of my life, raised in an evangelical church, and it's amazing how little I knew about the kingdom of God. And part of that is, I don't know, just because it wasn't talked about very much. And part of it was that I had made certain assumptions about the phrase when I encountered it in Scripture, which I now see were, you know, not, not the right assumptions to make. I couldn't have even defined the kingdom of God 
probably until I'd been in, in the ministry for several years. Uh, but since 1974, it's been the major, the major concern in my teaching. I mean, I think everything in the Bible is about the kingdom of God. Once you know the paradigm that Jesus was talking about, everything is part of it. Uh, but I had thought for years that maybe I'd write a book on it. I don't write many books, but it seemed like if I wrote a few, I should at least write one on this subject. So I decided last December, when I was actually here, that I would spend the first three months of 2020 writing a book on the subject. Uh, I hoped three months would be long enough. I didn't know COVID would lock us all in involuntarily and give me a lot of opportunity to undistractedly write. Uh, but I didn't really get started on it until February. I was busy with some other things. And I started at the beginning of February. And by the end of February, I'd written the whole book. And it was much too long to be a single book. So I decided this is going to be two books. Book one and book two on the same subject. They both have the same title. Uh, the title is Empire of the Risen Sun, S-O-N. And, and uh and they have subtitles. The first book is called There Is Another King. The second book is called All the King's Men. And it turns out that the first book is uh, really pretty much a development of my teaching series called The Kingdom of God. And the second book is more a development of my teaching series called Genuinely Following Jesus, which is about discipleship. Both of them were going to be part of the original book idea, what part giving the concept and part giving the practical application to it. But I was hoping the whole thing would be about 300 pages. As it turned out, it was closer to 900 pages that I wrote. So uh, I knew that if I published a 900-page book, some people say, wow, that's impressive, but most people never open it. Uh, I don't. I don't open a 900-page book because I'm a slow reader. I never get done with it. And so I'd rather write something short enough not to be intimidating. So I, get, I wrote two shorter books, uh, the first of which actually is coming out in within about 10 days. Uh, it's already out on Kindle, just came out this last weekend on Kindle, and the hard copy will be out um, October 15th. Um, that's the first book, and the second is also complete and at the publishers, and it's coming out a bit later. I don't know when. Now, I, that's, I think, what Steve wanted me to let you know, and it explains why on the itinerary I'm currently on, which is from California to Indiana, I'm speaking in several places, why it seems like in almost all the places I'm speaking, I'm speaking on this subject because those who have invited me knew I wrote a book and they wanted me to speak about the same subject. So that's what I'm doing today. And we're, this really is going to be a q and I'm hoping to speak briefly. Now, that will, honestly, I'm not very good at speaking briefly. I, have to, I just have to confess my fault here. I tend to be verbose and I tend to try to be very thorough. I'm going to try to be less so so that we can leave some time for questions and answers and not keep you out too late tonight. The kingdom of God is a, a, a term you'll encounter frequently in the New Testament. Although, if, when you first start reading through the New Testament, you're more likely to encounter the kingdom of heaven because the book of Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. No other book in the Bible does. You'll never find the term kingdom of heaven except in the book of Matthew. But it's found there, oh, I forget how many times, 20-something times. And the term kingdom of God, which is its equivalent, is used in Matthew only five times. Uh, when you come to Mark and Luke and John, well, I should say Mark and Luke because they're more parallel to Matthew than John is, but you'll find many of the same statements of Jesus that are in Matthew, where in Matthew he uses the term kingdom of heaven, but in Mark and Luke, the same statement uses the term kingdom of God. And that's because both terms are interchangeable. Now, not all theologies accept this fact. Some try to make some kind of distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, but that simply can't be done. All one has to do is look at the many times that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the same statement in parallel, and you'll notice that Matthew generally has kingdom of, uh, of, of heaven, and the other two consistently used kingdom of God. It's clear they're paraphrasing uh, kingdom of heaven, which is a Jewish expression. Uh, the Jews... When they spoke about God, they tried not to do so too frequently, not to use the name or the word God very frequently because they didn't want to cheapen it. And so it was common for the Jews to take some euphemism and replace the word God with the euphemism like the Most High or the Almighty 
or the Ancient of Days or something like that. These are not officially titles of God, but they became titles of God because Jews, in trying not to use the word God overly much so as to make it common, they would use some other term like that. And a very common term they used is heaven to replace the word God. For example, we know uh, the prodigal son, a Jewish boy, but uh, presumably, when he decided to come home, he said, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, he said to his father. Well, sinning against heaven means against God. When Jesus asked the Pharisees, uh, the baptism of John, was it from men or from heaven? Of course, he means from men or from God. Is John sent by God or is he sent by men? And this is a commonplace in he Hebrew usage. And the fact that this is the case even in Matthew, that he recognized that when he used the term kingdom of heaven, it's the same as kingdom of God, which he used less frequently, can be seen, for example, in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, Matthew 19, verse 23 um, and, and 4. When the rich young ruler had been told what he had to do to become a disciple, and he had actually declined and walked away sorrowful, Jesus remarked to his disciples the following words. In Matthew 19, 23, he said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you'll notice in verse 23, he used the term kingdom of heaven. In verse 24, he used the term kingdom of God. He said exactly the same thing about each. In fact, before he said the second thing, he said, I say it again. So he's, in others, he says, I'm repeating myself here. I'm not making a new point. I'm not making a new point about another subject. I'm making the same point again with greater emphasis. And you see, he used kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God interchangeably. Now, that's because Jesus did. Jesus was a Jew speaking to Jewish audiences. So he would sometimes use the term kingdom of God, but apparently very fre more frequently say kingdom of heaven just observing the Jewish sensitivity about overuse of the word God. Now, Mark and Luke wrote to Gentiles and assumed that they would not necessarily use or understand the Jewish idiom, uh, whereas Matthew did write to Jew a Jewish readership. Uh, Mark and Luke simply take the times when Jesus said kingdom of heaven and render them kingdom of God because they, they knew that's what, what he's talking about. The terms are, in fact, interchangeable. So... Don't be confused. And I have to say, the reason it took me longer than it should have to understand the term kingdom of God or, or the concept is because when you start reading the New Testament, you start with Matthew. And that's where right from the beginning, you find John the Baptist in Matthew 3 saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now in Mark, this, the message given by Jesus when John was put in prison in Mark 1.15 is the kingdom of God is at hand. But it's the same kingdom, not a different one. As you go through uh, Matthew, you find the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven all the time. Uh, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed seed in a field. The kingdom of God is like leaven put into a lump of dough. The kingdom of God, or, I, I'm sorry, Matthew says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to make a marriage for his son and so forth. The parables are about the kingdom of heaven. But where any of those parables appear in Mark or Luke, it, they are about the kingdom of God. So just to get that straight, but when you read Matthew before you read the other Gospels, you become acquainted, of course, with the term kingdom of heaven. And that gives the impression, at least it gave me the impression when I was younger, that it means heaven. The kingdom, of, uh, the kingdom must be heaven. Because when I talk about the kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the kingdom of Tonga or any other kingdom and give it a name, I mean the kingdom that is called this the kingdom that is called Saudi Arabia. So I thought the term kingdom of heaven meant the kingdom that is called heaven. And therefore the kingdom and heaven were synonyms. And I thought, oh, okay. And as an evangelical in this country that grew up uh, with the tradition that Jesus came to take us all to heaven and that the main mission of Jesus was to keep us out of hell, uh, it, is, uh, it, it only made sense that he'd always be talking about heaven and, and so forth. The problem is that I, I guess I had to say I didn't look carefully enough, is that the things Jesus said about the kingdom, whether he used the term kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, the things he said about the kingdom were not things you would say about heaven. For example, 
um, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a field in which uh, wheat and tares were sown, and they grew together, and they would continue to grow together until the end of the age, and then they'd be sorted out. Well, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is a field with the children of God and the children of the devil growing together until the end time. I mean, that's what he described it to mean. Is Does heaven have children of the devil growing in it? Um, how, in what way is heaven like a mustard seed? You know, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that begins very small and grows into a great tree and the birds nest in its branches. But heaven, that's, that certainly is not true of heaven. Heaven's not getting bigger and, and having birds nest in the branches and so forth. I mean, there's, there's so much that Jesus said about the kingdom that didn't make sense if I was thinking of it as heaven. And of course, it was getting to know the concept from the Old Testament that made, started to make sense of the meaning because when Jesus first preached, the first recorded sermon words of Jesus are in Mark 1, 15. It says there in verse 14 that he came in, when John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he was saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand or literally has drawn near in the Greek. The kingdom of God has drawn near, rear. It was coming here. And it was, he said, the time is fulfilled. That's the first line. In fact, the first word in the Greek text is fulfilled. Fulfilled is the time, is how it reads in the Greek. Fulfilled is the time the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, that statement, the fulfilled is the time, obviously, that's language of, of a plot resolution. You know, the time is fulfilled suggests there's been a time previously anticipating this fulfillment. This is fulfilling a hope. This is fulfilling something that was expected. And, and, and he's saying, it has come. It has drawn near. What you were looking for all these centuries past, you Jewish people, has now arrived. And so in order to understand what Jesus and John the Baptist were announcing, we have to understand what the Jews were expecting. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think what Jesus was announcing uh, was not exactly the same. It certainly was not exactly the same as what the Jews were expecting, but it was not entirely uh, different. And so let me just tell you what the concept of the kingdom of God is. Now, the first time God ever spoke of wanting or having a kingdom was after he brought Israel out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, and he said to Moses there in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, he said, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the nations, for all the earth is mine, says the Lord, and you shall be a kingdom of priests to me and a holy nation. Now this, of course, he said, this is what you shall say, Moses, to the children of Israel. Tell them that if they will obey my voice and keep my covenant, they will be a kingdom to me. They'll be my kingdom. And they'll be a holy nation. Now, notice when he talked about them being a kingdom, he wasn't talking about when they die and go somewhere else. He wasn't talking about something that was going to be on another planet or, or out in outer space or out in heaven somewhere else. He's talking about right there on earth. They would be a holy nation among, among the other nations that were not holy. There were all the ordinary nations, but they were going to be a special, set apart, holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Now, the simple definition of a kingdom in any context is that of a government or a nation, a society, I think would be the best way to put it, that is governed by a king. If you have a society governed by Congress or by, you know, president or, a, you know, separation of powers, you don't have a kingdom. In fact, the American government was founded specifically to avoid being a kingdom. All the people who founded this country had lived in countries that were kingdoms in Europe, and they didn't want that. They didn't want kings. But a society governed by a king is a kingdom. All you need to have a kingdom is a king and somebody who is governed by him, his subjects. Now, God was saying to Israel, I want to have a kingdom, and you're, I'm choosing you to be my kingdom. But you have, to, you have to act like I'm a king. You have to obey my voice. You have to keep my covenant. And if you do, you'll be a kingdom to me of priests, and you'll be a holy nation. Now, notice the kingdom of God, then, as God first refers to having a kingdom, is, first of all, on planet Earth, not somewhere else. 
Second, it was a people, not a place. It was the people of Israel who would be obedient to him. Well, we're told to be. But we know that Israel's history was such that they were very seldom obedient to him and very seldom kept his covenant. They worshiped Baal, they worshiped Moloch, they even made a golden calf right from the very beginning. These people were uh, continually straying from God and, and betraying him. And although he was their king for many centuries, especially during the period of the judges, during which you read several times in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel which was a good thing because God didn't want them to have a king in Israel. He, he was their king. Uh, they went about 380 years probably in the period of judges with no, no earthly king. By the way, they had judges that God raised up, but they weren't kings. And when Gideon, one of those judges, delivered Israel from the Midianites, the people said to him in, uh, in Judges chapter 8, they said, uh, you have delivered us from the Midianites. Rule over us, Gideon, you and your son and your son's son, which obviously meant they wanted to set up a hereditary dynasty, beginning with Gideon. He'd be their first king, and then his son would be the next, and so forth. And Gideon rejected this. He says, I, will, you know, my, I won't reign over you, and my son and my son's son won't. God will reign over you. In other words, he knew they were God's kingdom. They weren't going to be ruled by a man. They're, they had a greater privilege than that. They were ruled by God. And so they continued without an earthly king until the end of the period of the judges. But at that time, again, Israel getting antsy for, to be less connected to God and more like other nations, they came to Samuel, the last of the judges, and they said, make us a king to reign over us, like all the nations. And Samuel was displeased, and he spoke to God about it, and God spoke to him and said, uh, don't, don't be all upset about this, They're not, and don't take it personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me that I should not reign over them. Now notice, when they asked for an earthly king, God took that as a rejection of him reigning over them. They have not rejected you, Samuel, they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. In that sense, they formally decided, we don't really want to be the kingdom of God anymore. Now God allowed them to continue to have a special relationship with him, even though they had kings, but he had to choose the kings, at least the initial kings, uh, and, and also the kings under the law of Moses, had to, uh, you know, read the Torah, the, the, the law, and had to obey God. They had to answer to the prophets. So these, these were going to be earthly kings, but they were subject themselves to God and his instructions through the prophets and the law. So in a sense, they were kind of still the kingdom of God, but not in the same original sense. And in, under the kings, they became very corrupt. They became more corrupt than they ever were in the period of the judges. And they strayed from God. There are hardly any years in the monarchy period when Israel was faithful to God. The northern kingdom broke off and had 20 uh, or 19 evil kings, no good ones. The southern kingdom had, oh, maybe uh, 15 evil kings about, and about five good ones. So out of almost 40 kings, there were five good ones and 35 evil ones. And that's not a good record, even though they're supposed to be God's people. They were all worshiping Baal and Moloch and these other gods. So, in other words, the kingdom of God had pretty much dwindled down to something uh, that it was not. They were not really, the kingdom was kind of a thing of the past. But the prophets came, uh, and they said God would send a king and would restore his kingdom among Israel. And, uh, and they looked to him as uh, what they called the Messiah. The word Messiah, as I'm sure you know, is the Hebrew version of the, of the Greek word Christos or Christ, and both words in their original languages mean anointed one, and it's specifically an anointed king. Saul, the first king, was anointed with oil. That's how he became king. Uh, David was anointed with oil, the second king. That's the way a king was installed, by anointing. So the Jews spoke of the anointed one that would come, meaning the, the new king that would be anointed to rule, and his kingdom would be a restoration of the glories of an earlier day of Israel. Yeah, you know, the best days of Israel in the Old Testament were in David's reign. David was a good king. The nation was largely righteous compared to later times. And God was so pleased with David, a man after his own heart, that he made a promise to David and said, you know, I'm going to establish your kingdom forever. One of your seed is always going to reign 
over Israel. And, uh, and in fact, the Messiah himself will be of your seed. So the Jews had this expectation that somebody descended from David would rise up and be kind of like a second David. David was a great conqueror, a great warrior, and a great ruler for the most part. I mean, he has his flaws. But in his reign, Israel became most, the most prominent nation in the Near East. He brought other nations under his tribute, Moab and Ammon and Edom and the Philistines and others. And because of that, he actually had an empire, not just the kingdom of God. It was the empire of David because he, was, he reigned not only his own country, but all the surrounding countries that were conquered by him. That's, that's an empire. And so the Jews, or I should say Israel, was very proud of themselves and very happy with the, the, what was like in David's day. They were very prosperous, very rich. He was possibly the most powerful king in the world at that time. There might have been some in places that weren't very near him that were more powerful. But the point is, it was Israel's greatest time. It was, it was the golden age of the kingdom for Israel when David reigned. And so when the prophet said that the Messiah would come and he'd be like David, he'd deliver his people, he'd reign over his people in righteousness, uh, he'd conquer these, the Gentiles. All these things were taken by the Jews to mean the Messiah would be pretty much like David. I mean, he'd come and he'd, David had delivered them from the Philistine bondage. And so whatever, whoever people were uh, oppressing Israel at a given time, they thought, well, when Messiah comes, he'll drive those people out. Certainly when Jesus came, Israel was oppressed by the Romans. And so in his day, they thought the Messiah, when he comes, will drive out the Romans. But it'd be a military thing. And then he would sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and reign as David did, not only over Israel, but over the Gentiles that would be conquered by him. This is what the Jews expected. And this would be, in their opinion, the restoration of the kingdom of God under David's successor, the Messiah. Now, it was entirely a political picture that they had. And no surprise, I mean, why wouldn't they? David had been totally a political leader. I mean, he was a spiritual and godly man, but he was, it was a political kingdom that David ruled over. So they had every expectation that the Messiah would establish Israel again as a political kingdom. Even after Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples had not been fully disabused of this idea. Because the last question the disciples asked Jesus before he ascended in Acts 1 6 was, Will you restore at this time the kingdom to Israel? Now, it is in fact the case that Jesus did come to restore the kingdom to Israel, but his disciples were not in a position to understand what is meant by Israel at that point, because that would, it would only be the remnant of Israel that the prophets really were referring to, the faithful of Israel, who in fact did come to Messiah. They did come to Jesus when he was here and became his disciples. And the kingdom itself, they understood wrongly too. And again, it wasn't their fault, except that Jesus had given them hints that he wasn't there to establish a political kingdom. When he sat with Nicodemus in private conference, he said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. And then a few verses later he said, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he will not enter the kingdom of God. Obviously, there's something spiritual has to happen to enter this kingdom. In Luke 17 and verse 20, the Pharisees demanded of Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. Notice the kingdom of God was something to come. It's not something you die and go away to when you die. They were expecting the kingdom of God to come. And Jesus didn't hold a different view than that. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Men will not say, lo, here it is, or lo, there it is. But he said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's already here. It already has come. It's just here in the crowd. How so? What is a kingdom? It's a kingdom. It's a society reigned by a king. He was the king. He was the Messiah. And there were people even in the crowd among them who were already part of his, they were subject to him. They were his disciples. Not everyone was, but the kingdom of God was there infiltrating in their midst. When Jesus was accused of casting out demons by Beelzebub in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, he answered, uh, I forget, around verse 20, maybe verse 25 through 28, something like that, or, tw or 29. Uh, he said, you know, if Satan casts out Satan, then his kingdom cannot stand. So there's a kingdom of Satan. 
But he said, but if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has overtaken you. That it has arrived and you didn't notice it. So there's two kingdoms, Jesus said. There's a kingdom of Satan, which would not do well if Satan was casting out Satan. And there was a kingdom of God that was manifest by the fact that Jesus was casting out demons by the Spirit of God. Now, everything Jesus said indicated the kingdom was there. And yet, on one occasion, after Jesus fed the 5,000 with uh, you know, the loaves and the fishes, it says in John 6.15, it says, when Jesus saw that the multitudes were about to take him by force and make him king, he sent the crowds away and withdrew to a private place to pray. In other words, he was not into it. They wanted to make him king in that way that they were thinking. They wanted him to you know, stir up the Israel like the judges had done or even like David had done and drive out the Romans and sit in Jerusalem and rule like a regular king. That was not Jesus' plan. Jesus' plan was, in fact, to set up a kingdom, and it would be, in fact, uh, on earth, and it would, in fact, be with him reigning over his subjects. But it would not be politically connected necessarily with any one nation like Israel. It would be international. He was going to draw all men to himself if he was lifted up, and, uh, and Jews and Gentiles alike who would embrace him as Lord and King would be thereby brought into the sway of this kingdom of his. Now, Paul, of course, spoke this way very clearly in Colossians, writing to the Christians there in Colossae about what had happened when they became believers. In Colossians 1.13, Paul said that you, God has, trans, has, has uh, delivered you from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his own dear son. So Paul saw Christians have been brought into the kingdom. Now that doesn't mean that in some mysterious way we're up in heaven in the sky. I know you can probably think of a verse in Ephesians that says we're seated in Christ in heavenly places, but the kingdom he's talking about is not in the sky. It's, it's here. It's now. It has a future in eternity. When Jesus comes back, it'll be universal in the new heavens and the new earth, but it's not, doesn't have to wait till then. And that's important to know because there is a theological position out there very broadly taught. In fact, its uh, central headquarters seems to be in this state of Texas, in Dallas, uh, but it's been around a long time and there are other hubs of that teaching that teach that when Jesus came and said the kingdom of God is at hand, he actually was planning are offering to establish the very kind of kingdom they were looking for, namely to drive out the Romans and him sit in Jerusalem forever as king right there then and then and have a political nation just like David had had. Uh, the dispensational view holds that Jesus was offering that, but that the Jews rejected it, and therefore it was postponed, and that the kingdom was not established by Jesus. Uh, it was a failure, basically, because of the Jews rejecting him, but that at the end of time, Jesus will return and then he'll establish the kingdom as the millennial reign after he returns. They consider the kingdom of God to be the millennium. And why? Because they say Jesus did not establish the kingdom when he was here, even though he said he did, even though he said, I mean, he promised it was at hand, it had even come already, but somehow he failed. Strangely, it'd be an amazing thing if the main thing Jesus came to do was he was a failure at it. In fact, it would be especially strange that he would pray at the end of his ministry in John 17, 4, and say, Father, I have finished the work that you sent me to do. Well, if he had, in fact, failed to do the work God sent him to do, it's a very strange boast on his part. And there is no scripture anywhere that suggests that the kingdom was postponed. From the time Jesus and John the Baptist said that it was at hand, there's not a clue in scripture anywhere that it wasn't or is not still. Now, Jesus taught us to pray, and I knew this prayer all my life, though some of the lines I didn't know what they meant. Among other things, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, I was raised with the idea that the whole purpose of Jesus was the same as the purpose of religions. Religions, generally speaking, 
seem to play the function. And it doesn't matter which religion it is, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, you name it, Judaism, even Christian religion. Religions tend to uh, have the primary appeal of something that will make you have peace at the time of death and give you a better afterlife. That uh, if you do your religion right, you do the rituals, you, do the, you, you keep the morals, that when you stand before the judge at the end of time, he'll say, you're all right, come on in. In other words, a religion for most people, and it, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Christian religion or any other religion, a religion is a way of getting past the security detail in heaven at the judgment day. And it has, I mean, it does require some rules to be kept. Every religion has its rules, and they might be moral, they might be ritual, or they might be both. But the idea is if you do the rules, you'll, you'll get what it was all about, and that is to go to heaven instead of hell when you die. But Jesus had very little to say about going to heaven, honestly. Uh, we have mistakenly thought that his, all his talk about the kingdom of heaven was about heaven. And that's how people got the wrong idea that Jesus is just here to make sure you go to heaven instead of hell. Jesus hardly ever spoke about hell, though he spoke about it more than any other person in the Bible. Paul didn't ever mention hell by name. None of the epistles, in fact, do. Uh, Revelation mentions it a few times, and, and Jesus mentioned it a few times. But although the Gospels record the events of about 39 days distributed through th three and a half years of Jesus' life, apparently the Gospel writers felt these 39 days would be a good sample of what, of what Jesus was about, what he did and taught generally. There's only about four of those days where he seems to have said anything about hell, which means about one day out of ten. It's not an emphasis. Jesus hardly ever mentioned hell. It's not like he didn't believe in it. He did, and I do too. But it wasn't his emphasis by any means. Neither was going to heaven. His emphasis was the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like that. All the parables about the kingdom. When Jesus sent out the 12 two by two in Matthew 10, he said, go tell these villages the kingdom of God is at hand. He sent out the 70 in Luke chapter 10 and said, go out and tell People, the kingdom of God's hand. Everything's about the kingdom. In fact, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, it says in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus spent 40 days appearing to the disciples and speaking to them of things concerning the kingdom of God. Even though the Jews had rejected him, he's still talking about the kingdom of God. It's not postponed. In fact, Paul knew nothing of it being postponed. Uh, the last verse in Acts says that Paul remained two full years in a rented house receiving all that would come to him and speaking to them of things concerning the kingdom of God. It's a one-stringed instrument in the New Testament. Whether it's Paul, whether it's Peter, whether it's Jesus, whether it's John the Baptist, there's only one message there. It's the kingdom of God, and it's not about what happens when you die. There are ramifications when you die, obviously. If you are in the kingdom of God now, you'll be in the kingdom of God, assuming you remain loyal to the king, You'll be in the kingdom of God forever, even after you die. It's an eternal thing. It's, it never ends. But it's not the emphasis of Jesus and Paul in the New Testament writers is very seldom have anything to do with the next life. It, people are marvel at how little is said in the Bible describing heaven or hell. I mean, they're there. But when someone says, well, when we go to heaven, we'll be like this, or will we do that? Will we recognize it? Will our pets be there? You know, I mean, people have all these questions about heaven, and when they call my show and ask those, I have to say, I'm sorry. The Bible tells us almost nothing about it. We have no details, except that we'll be with Jesus. We'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Until the resurrection, then we'll be with him, even in body. But, but the point is that the Bible is not about the next life. It's like religion is, and that's why Christianity... Even the preaching of the gospel, as we have heard it traditionally, has not been about the kingdom of God, though Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to every nation, and then the end shall come. So the end can't even come until the gospel of the kingdom has been preached throughout the world. Now, thankfully, there's lots of zealous people preaching the gospel as missionaries, but I don't know how many are preaching the gospel of the kingdom, because I was a pretty well-educated conservative, evangelical preacher for some years. And if you'd asked me what the gospel was, I would have said, well, uh, the gospel is that uh, despite our sinfulness, uh, God loved us, and therefore he sent Jesus to die for us. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. 
and, uh, and he expects us to believe in him so that when we die, we'll go to heaven instead of hell. I mean, that should, I would imagine, to most evangelicals listening to say, yeah, that kind of hits on the, the main points. That's kind of right, right? Isn't that the gospel? Well, if it is, no one told Jesus or Paul because neither of them ever preached it that way. Neither did Peter. We do have samples of sermons that were preached by Peter and Paul in the book of Acts to unbelieving audiences, and they never said those things. They, they, they never emphasized the universal sinfulness of man, though they believed in it. You see, we know what they believed in because they wrote epistles to Christian churches where they're not evangelizing. They're preaching to Christians about Christianity and we know they believed in these things. We know they believed in all men are sinful. We know they believe that Jesus died for our sins in such a way as to atone for them in some way. And we know that, of course, Jesus rose from the dead and that, uh, and that there's a, a lot of things that Christians know that were not mentioned when they preached the gospel in the book of Acts. You will look very hard to find in the sermons of Peter or Paul much that gives much indication of, of the doctrine of the atonement. Because apparently God is the one who most of all needs to understand that doctrine. We may not understand it very well at all. If we become part of Christ's kingdom, it works for us. The atonement covers us. We are saved. We are justified by what Jesus did. But it's not knowing about that fact that makes it so. It's so whether we know it or not. But, but we're not necessarily Christians automatically. There is something that makes us Christians. What makes us Christians is the same thing that made the disciples Christians. When Jesus came and called the four fishermen, they left their nets and became his followers. When he came to Matthew at the receipt of custom, he called him, said, follow me. He followed him. And Jesus called lots of people to follow him. And when they did, they were his disciples. And it says in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So you became a disciple by not saying a sinner's prayer, not by raising your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed. You became a Christian by leaving your old life and becoming a committed follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You'll find rest to your soul. But what does it mean to take a yoke upon you? Well, a yoke is put over the, the backs of animals to make them serve and be directed by the man who's driving uh, you know, the cart or the plow. In other words, taking his yoke means that we come under his rule, under his control. We learn from him. We become learners and followers of him. That's, that's becoming, that's coming to Christ. But I always preached in the early years, and I always had it preached to me when I was growing up in the church, that to become a Christian means you say a certain prayer. And it has something to do with you know, asking Jesus to come into your heart. I never read anywhere in any verse of the Bible about asking Jesus to come into your heart. And certainly no one in the Bible became a Christian that we know of by saying a prayer. You can say all the prayers you want to, but if you don't follow Jesus, you didn't become a Christian. Following Jesus, being a disciple, is what a Christian is. And following Jesus means you embrace him as your Lord and your King. If you have not done that, you're not you haven't entered the kingdom yet. You haven't embraced him as Savior yet. Now, I was also raised believing that you could have Jesus as your Savior without really necessarily having him as your Lord. That is a, one of the strangest and perhaps most damaging doctrines in modern American evangelicalism because the Bible nowhere teaches it and teaches the opposite. In Romans 10, 9, Paul said... It, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and that has the same ramification saying he's king. The Lord is your absolute ruler. The king is your absolute, I mean, these are different. A head of a body is an absolute ruler of the body. All these images of Christ that we're supposed to recognize is he's the absolute ruler. When you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. In other words, you, he becomes your savior at the time that you acknowledge him as your Lord. So, when you come into the kingdom, you come into eternal life. You know, the rich young ruler came running to Jesus saying, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know, give to the poor and things, I mean, keep the law and give to the poor. The man said, you know, he went away sorrowful. And when Jesus saw that, he said to his disciples, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom 
of God. Now, having eternal life, which is what the man was asking about, was the same as entering the kingdom of God, but he didn't get either because he didn't, he didn't enter the kingdom of God. He didn't have eternal life. And the disciples said, who then can be saved? Notice in that conversation, having eternal life, entering the kingdom of God, being saved, these are all used interchangeably. You see, a king in the Bible, and it probably in other contexts other than the Bible too, but especially in the Bible, a king was someone who saved his people as well as ruled over them. A king was the savior of the people. You remember I said that the people wanted Gideon to be their king. They start by saying, you have saved us from the hand of Gideon. Be our king. When Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel, some said, how can this man save us? And then later he did save some people in Ramoth Gilead, and, and he delivered them. And then they said, okay, hail the king. Hail, hail Saul. Uh, the king would be the one who would save You'll find this to be in the Psalms. Uh, in, in Hosea, God says, uh, you know, I will be your king. I will save you. The, the idea is the king is the one who rescues his people, and then out of gratitude, they raise him up. Even in this country, after the Revolutionary War, the leadership of George Washington caused uh, the victorious, you know, Collins to say, you should be our king. You remember, he was offered a position of king, but he rejected it, and he chose, you know, a different system, not a monarchy in this country. But it's kind of the natural thing throughout history that the person who saves the nation is kind of considered to be in the position to be offered the rule of the nation. And contrary-wise, the person who is ruling the nation, it's his obligation to save the nation. The ruler is the savior. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord or ruler, then you will be saved. Salvation is found in Christ's lordship, in Christ's kingship. And when you embrace Christ's kingship, you have entered the kingdom of God. You've been uh, delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his son. So the kingdom of God is really comprised of those people who have embraced Christ as Lord and King. Now, I had almost said the kingdom of God is the church, but the problem with that statement is church might refer to the institutional church. And of course, the institutional church is not the same thing as the kingdom. This is the mistake the Roman Catholics made uh, in the Middle Ages. They, they believed the kingdom of God was the Roman Catholic church. Now, this is only because they understood church in an institutional way, and it was them as far as they were concerned. It is true that in biblical terminology, the kingdom of God is the church, because the true church is not the institutional church. It is those who are members of the body of Christ, and he's the head. Having a head is the same as having a king. You, as, as Christ is the head of all the members of the body, he's the king of all his subjects. It's just different, different metaphors to, way, uh, to speak of his lordship. If you're not in the body of Christ, you're not in the church. You might be in the institutional church, you're not in, in God's church, you're not in Christ's church. He's not your head. But if he is your head, then he's your king and your lord. And you're like a follower, and you're a subject of him. So the true church, comprised globally of all who really are disciples of Jesus in reality, is also, you know, it's the same, comprised the same as the kingdom itself. Now, I'm going to actually close with this, or just make a few more points, because I don't want to go as long on this as I am tempted to. Remember, I wrote 900 pages on this recently, and I have an eight-lecture uh, eight series on it uh, at our website, and it's very, very hard for me to compress this. It's been, I don't know if you realize, it's been almost an hour now, and so I do need to wind this down, but there's so much more to say. Um, I will say this. The kingdom of God, you'll find in the Bible, sometimes it talks about entering the kingdom of God. Sometimes it talks about inheriting the kingdom of God, and it's very important that we understand the difference here, because I encounter frequently teachers who think they're teaching the kingdom of God, and, and what they're saying is somewhat close, very close to the, the truth, but they, they're just wrong about one important thing. They say, we are the kingdom of God, therefore we are king's kids, and therefore we should reign in earth as king's kids. We should not be living poor, 
We should not uh, be uh, persecuted and trampled on. We should be ruling as princes and kings. We are king's kids. We should live in prosperity. We should live in victory. We should have d dominion. And, uh, and actually, uh, there's uh, one particular very famous uh, teacher, now, now deceased. He died in a plane accident. Uh, Miles Monroe is his name, uh, who wrote many books about the kingdom of God. And much of what he wrote was commendable, but he had this, this flaw. He, kept, he saw being in the kingdom, meaning you're a king. Now, he was just off by this amount. When we enter the kingdom of God, that's what we do now. When we inherit the kingdom of God, that's what happens when Jesus comes back. Jesus said, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and his angels with him, he'll sit on the throne of his glory, Matthew 25, 31, and he'll call all the nations before him, and he'll separate them like sheep and goats, and he'll say to the sheep, enter into the kingdom. Inher no, he said, he said, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You inherit the kingdom when Jesus comes. You enter the kingdom now. In fact, if you don't enter it now, you won't inherit it then. But what's the difference? It's simply this. At this stage, though the kingdom exists and Christ is reigning from the right hand of God, those who embrace his kingship and lordship today come as subjects to the king. When Jesus comes back, Paul said, if we endure, we'll reign with him. It, we will reign with Christ when we inherit the kingdom. It's like a prince inherits a throne from his king and a scepter. When a king dies, his son inherits the kingdom. That means he rules. He gets a throne. He gets a scepter. We will inherit the kingdom as co-rulers with Christ. We enter the kingdom in this phase as simply subjects of Christ. We're not, we're not living like king's kids now because the war is not over and the king's kids are in the trenches. You don't live in the palace and live like a king when you're on the battlefield. When the battle is over, then we go to the, the palace and then we inherit thrones and, and power and authority and so forth. So uh, this is, I think, a mistake some people make. When we talk about entering the kingdom of God, we're talking about becoming a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ, a servant of Christ, uh, uh, a member of his body over which he reigns, a servant in his household, a, a subject under his reign. That's what... That's what it means to be in the kingdom. And this kingdom grows as more and more people become part of it. And you know what shrinks is the kingdom of Satan because everyone is really pretty much in God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. And when someone gets converted out of Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom, God's kingdom has gotten bigger, but Satan's has gotten smaller, which is why he puts up so much resistance. He doesn't like it. But you see, the growth of the kingdom is predicted to be successful. Uh, in the story of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the, you know, the image with the many metals and so forth, I can't go into it if you're not familiar with it. I think you probably are. There was a stone that struck this image in the feet, and it grew into a great mountain to fill the whole earth. Daniel said, this is what that's about. In the days of these kings, in the context the Roman Empire would have to be the kings he's talking about, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and it shall consume all these kingdoms and it itself will last forever. It's depicted like a stone growing to be a whole mountain to fill the whole earth. This is what has happened in the 2,000 years since Christ established his kingdom. When he sat on the right hand of God, there were about 120 followers. Now, one-third of the human population identifies as Christian. It's about 15, you know, uh, wait, how much is it? About 1.5 billion. That's what, about one five, that's, or 2 billion. There's, there's about a third of the human population is called Christian, though we know that's institutional church Christian. We, know, we don't know how many are really disciples. But even if it's one out of 10 or one out of 100, that's still hundreds of millions all over the world. That's a big growth from 120. The kingdom grows like a little stone originally into a great mountain to fill the earth. And in Revelation 11, 15, it says the time comes when the seventh trumpet is blown that it says, an angel says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. So he becomes universal king. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when that happens, we will be reigning with him. Uh, so this kingdom has a destiny. In fact, it's the trajectory of history. History has no sensible 
transcendent meaning, except in terms of what God is intending to do. What he began to do through Israel in the Old Testament, which he now does through those who are subject to Christ as king, and what uh, will eternally will be the case when Jesus returns and we're reigning with him. Uh, so, you know, history isn't just a bunch of random things that, you know, don't mean much and go, runs in cycles. It's a trajectory that God has established. After man fell, God set up a system of salvation that would include as many people in his kingdom as would be willing to come and would be saved there and would someday reign with him. And, and of course, the rest will be judged. But this is the, the whole message, really, of the Bible is the kingdom of God. But the ramifications it has for us is to realize that when I became a Christian, I didn't just get a ticket to heaven. And now I have to, all I have to do is kind of hope I don't apostatize before Jesus comes back and lose my salvation or something like that. But rather, I got recruited into a kingdom. I have a, a living king, and I'm, I'm recruited into his kingdom, which is at war against another kingdom. And that makes me an active participant in warfare. It, it turns the whole world not into a playground, but a battleground. And it's, uh, it gives purpose for existence. Humans, if you're not involved in promoting the kingdom of God, you're not involved in reality. You don't understand the world you're in. You don't really have any transcendent purpose other than perhaps in your own mind to survive long enough to be saved when you die, you know, when you go to heaven. But God has a plan for the earth. That's why we pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. That's the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, of course, in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. There's only one thing we have to be aimed at, and that is the promotion of the kingdom of God. Not just for my personal salvation. I used to think that that meant I need to seek most of all that I would be a part of the kingdom or that the kingdom would have some realization in, in me. No, it's not about me. It's about, it's about, frankly, Christ's global claims. You know, everything seems to be about me if I'm a, a narcissist, which most of us are by nature. When I understand the kingdom of God, it's not about me. It's about God. It's about his kingdom. It, I'm, I'm dispensable. If I, if I go on the mission field and I die in a shipwreck before I get to the mission field, eh, it's not going not gonna, to, it's no, no big thing in the grand scheme of things. God's kingdom is going to continue to make its conquests. But my presence in it, while I am alive, only, my life only has meaning if I'm seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And if I do so, I really don't have to seek anything else. Everything else I need will be added to me. So this is the, the wonderful, the gospel of the kingdom of God. There's another king, one Jesus. And we don't have to be serving the, the brutal king that the world serves. We can serve a king that's going to share his throne with us at one time. And Paul said, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a pretty good way to live, to have righteousness and peace and joy through the Holy Spirit. Those are benefits of being in the kingdom. The kingdom itself is the society of those who follow Jesus and embrace him as king and are loyal to death uh, to their master. So I'm going to just close with that. That's been exactly uh, one hour, and we're not going to go any longer on this so we can have some time for Q&A. And I think, Steve, you're probably going to moderate that, aren't you? No, no, you, you stay right there. Okay. Um, we do have a mic set up over here. So if you do have questions, I, I would like for us to kind of begin with any questions around the topic. We have uh, some people online that have a couple of questions about the kingdom of God on Facebook and YouTube. So if they're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, they can enter in any of your questions in the comments section, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, those in-house, if you will, just kind of make your way over here if you have any questions. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Rachel on Facebook, and uh, you kind of led into this pretty well as you distinguished between uh, the difference between entering the kingdom of God and inheriting the kingdom of God. As I believe uh, the verse she mentioned from Galatians 5.21 quotes inheriting, I believe. Right, it is. Uh, she says, thanks for mentioning the dispensational view. At one time, I was told there was a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, 
and I could not grasp Galatians 5.21. What does this verse mean to a dispensationalist? Okay, well, um, I have to say that dispensationalists do typically make a distinction between the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. But while I was a dispensational teacher for many years, and since leaving that system, I've tried to get clarity by reading dispensational authors about this, to, for the, the life of me, I cannot really make sense of it. I think they don't, all, they are concerned not to identify the two as the same thing, but they don't all agree as to what it is. I looked up online, uh, John Walvoord, former uh, chancellor of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, a bastion of dispensationalism, and online I found a thing he'd written on the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, and I read it and it just made me totally confused. It, it sounded like he was totally confused. It just, the statements just didn't make sense, and I've never been able to, now I will say this, when I was younger, something that my teachers told me made me think that they feel that the kingdom of heaven is in some way identified with the church, including not the true church, but the institutional church, because you've got the wheat and the tares in the kingdom, you see. Um, I mean, the kingdom of God is like a man who sowed good seed, but his enemy sowed tares and so forth. So they say, well, if there's wheat and tares in there, and if there's birds in the branches of the mustard seed kingdom of heaven, that's, that refers to infiltration with evil. So I think they tended to take the kingdom of heaven to mean something like the visible church or something like that, which was corruptible, but that the kingdom of God was something like when Jesus comes back and establishes the millennium. Now, if any dispensationalists listening say, no, that's not how I differ, d distinguish them, um, it's not my fault. No one has made it clear. And uh, this is the impression I got from my dispensational teachers. And when I have tried to get clarity on that from others, dispensationalists, they're just all over the place with it. But uh, the truth is, it's really a fool's errand to try to find a difference between the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven because the Bible uses them as interchangeable terms for the same thing, the one kingdom. There's only one kingdom, the kingdom of Christ and God. It is called the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of heaven, and it's even called uh, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God's dear son and the kingdom of uh, God and Christ. Once Paul uses in Ephesians 5, the kingdom of God and Christ. So these terms, there's only one kingdom that's being talked about with all these terms. There's not two or, or more different kingdoms that the Bible's concerned with. Because many passages simply say the kingdom without modifying. And if, if there's more than one in the New Testament to think about, uh, this would be very confusing. Well, which one are they talking about this time? You know. Now, what does Galatians 5.21 mean? Well, this is at the end of a list of what Paul calls the works of the flesh, beginning at verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and he lists all these horrible vices and says this is what the flesh produces when you walk in the flesh. Of course, a couple of verses earlier said if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but these are the works of the flesh. And at the end of that, in verse 21, he says, and those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And um, uh, likewise, the same thing is said in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses uh, 9 and 10, where Paul again lists, uh, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he lists neither, you know, neither adulterers and idolaters and fornicators and things. He lists quite a few things, and he says, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So both Galatians 5.21 and, and 1 Corinthians 6 list these sins. It says people who do these things meaning those who do them without repenting of them. You know, obviously, um, all Christians have done some of those before they were Christians. Uh, but those who are unrepentant fornicators, unrepentant idolaters and drunkards and so forth, uh, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, which, to my mind, suggests this. Since inheriting the kingdom of God means reigning with Christ when he returns, there may be some people who actually are Christians, but they stumble around and they're not really very... They're not as obedient as they should be. I mean, they intend to be, but they're kind of not fighting the good warfare, and they mess up a lot, and their life is really a, a reproach to Christ. And when he comes, it's not like they, not like they didn't take him seriously. It's just they didn't, they didn't live their lives and fight the warfare in such a way as to avoid those patterns, and they, they will not reign with Christ. But maybe they'll be the ones reigned over by the others. So, you know, you, if we're going to reign with Christ, who are we going to reign over? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say who we're going to reign over. Maybe the animals like Adam and Eve did, or maybe the 
maybe aliens from other planets, or maybe people on this earth who, who really did embrace Christ, but it wasn't as uh, compelling to them. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't their whole life. I don't know. Uh, this is something that's not made clear. But what is clear is that persons who do not live a holy life, or at least are not determined and habitually seeking to live a holy life, will not reign with Christ. They will not inherit a throne with him. I think that's what Paul is saying in both the passages where he says people who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, you think there's some significance to Galatians saying those who practice them? Yes, I think so, because even people who are true loyalists to Jesus stumble. I mean, the apostle James said, in many things we all stumble. Stumbling is, of course, falling, but it's not falling permanently, and it's not a pattern. Uh, we do not stumble in terms of literal walking, we don't stumble all the time. We stumble when we're careless. We stumble when we're weak. Uh, we stumble when we're not paying attention. But, but when we do stumble, we don't just make that a pattern. We just say, oh, I don't want to do that again. You know, you're embarrassed of it. You hope no one saw it. You hope no one will ever know you did it because it's embarrassing. It's not what you want to do. You want to walk. If you trip over a root of a tree when you weren't paying attention, it's, it's not what you intended, but you were careless and fell. And, and everyone stumbles sometimes, but a, they don't, Christians don't walk in sin. They stumble into sin, but they don't walk in it. They walk in love. They walk in the spirit. They walk in holiness. That's the walk of a person who's taken Jesus seriously. Uh, Brian on YouTube says, hello, Brother Steve. What is the best activity or quality that a disciple should do or have in the kingdom of God? In other words, what should I dedicate myself to? Well, of course, Jesus uh, indicated that the, the mark of a disciple is that you love one another as he loved us. This is the law of the kingdom. In fact, James refers to it as the royal law, meaning the law of the king. It's royal because it's from the king, and it's the law of, for the believer, and he identifies the royal law as love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, so certainly, obeying Jesus doesn't mean memorize uh, 613 laws and try to make sure you don't you know, mess up on any of them. That was Judaism. You know, that was the law at Sinai. But it is, in fact, it's walking in the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is walking with Jesus and seeking to be like him. Uh, as it says in 1 John uh, 2, I think it's verse 4, maybe it's verse 6, I think it's verse 2. Second, uh, First John 2, 4, perhaps, he says, if anyone says he knows him, he ought to walk even as he walked. So, you know, if you're walking with Jesus, you're, you're like a kid walking with his dad and, and noticing, you know, imitating his dad, you know, because he wants to be like him. And to imitate Christ, to obey Christ, uh, really it doesn't come down to learning a lot of rules. It comes down to having the spirit of Christ which means you're like, like him internally, and he, he gives you that. If you walk in the Spirit, he produces love. So the, the, one thing, the one thing that's indispensable in following Christ is love. And love, of course, is not what the world calls love. I mean, there's virtually everything in the Sermon on the Mount would be a good illustration of what loving your neighbor looks like. That's what that's for, that sermon. And um, in fact, in that sermon... Jesus, near the end of it, said in, in Matthew 7, 12, whatever you want others to do to you, do that to them. This is the whole law and the prophets. So the whole rule of life for the believer is to do to others what you want done to you, which is the same thing as love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's the same law put in practical terms. But what it points out is that love is not a way of feeling. It's a way of doing. What you want done to you, you do that. That's loving your neighbors. You love yourself. So you don't have to like them. You don't have to have an emotion of love toward them. Sometimes you can't control whether you have emotions of one kind or another. We don't, our, our emotions don't come on our command. You know, they uh, are, sometimes they assail us and we can't get rid of them immediately, but we can still do the right thing. Uh, and so if I know that I would want to be treated or responded to a certain way, I have to make sure I respond to and, and treat somebody that way out of love for God and out of love for them. 
It doesn't mean I have feelings for them. It means I respect them as in the image of God and I value them as I value myself. That's, that's loving them as I love myself. And it is not just, as I say, feeling, it's doing. Uh, uh, when when the, the lawyer asked Jesus in Luke 15, you know, what's the great commandment? He said, love your neighbors, you love yourself. And he said, well, how do I do that? What's, who's my neighbor? Then comes the story of the Good Samaritan. And at the end of that, Jesus said, so which of these men who came upon the men, man who fell among thieves was a neighbor to him? It was who, who was loving to him, who was, who was loving his neighbor. And he said, well, he, him that showed mercy on him. Well, of course, what the Good Samaritan had done is endangered himself to save this man's life and gave his money and gave, uh, you know, gave up his day's agenda in order to make sure this man was cared for. I mean, this is loving your neighbors, you love yourself. It's, it's interesting because love, we always think of as having a strong emotional component. And liking does. And if we like something a great deal, we say we love it. But love, agape love, which is the mark of discipleship, the mark of the kingdom, isn't necessarily liking something. God so loved the world that was cursing him and th thumbing its nose at him. He didn't like it, but he loved it. You know, he gave his only begotten son. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life. That's something you do, not something you feel. I don't think Jesus felt real good about the, you know, the Caiaphas and those guys who were, and the soldiers that were beating him up, but he loved them. He laid his life down for them. That's what love is. It's, uh, it's, it's almost entirely practical. If you can cultivate feelings of fondness at the same time, it makes it easier. It's easier to serve and lay your life down for someone you're fond of, but even if you're not fond of them, you're supposed to love your enemy and do good to those who, who despitefully use you and bless those who curse you. This is what Jesus, that's what the king says. That's the law of the kingdom, the royal law. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, one more question on the kingdom of God. Okay. Um, what are we praying? I know you touched on this. Mm -hmm. we can just, what are we praying when we pray, thy kingdom come? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, Jesus said the kingdom of God had drawn near and was in your midst, so why do we need to pray for the kingdom to come? Well, the kingdom of God has come to earth, but it hasn't come to every corner of the earth. It is going, it's moving that direction. But the idea is, again, the, the prophet Daniel said, the kingdom of God is like a little stone that grows into a great mountain to fill the whole earth. So the stone has arrived, and it's even a growing mountain. It's, it's actually spread out internationally, but it needs to go to every creature. I mean, to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, need to disciple all nations. There's, in, in other words, the coming of the kingdom, I believe, is the infiltrating of the world and society by the power of the kingdom. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is like leaven, that a woman put into three measures of dough until the whole thing was leavened, our, our dispensational friends say, well, the leaven is evil and, and the kingdom of heaven is, is, uh, is infiltrated by evil. That's what he's saying. Why? Well, because they say leaven has to be evil. Well, who said that? Just because leaven does refer to evil things sometimes, like sin is compared with leaven, Jesus didn't say leaven was evil. He said the kingdom of heaven was like leaven. He didn't say it was like a lump of dough that somebody infiltrated with leaven. No, the kingdom itself functions like leaven in a lump. It causes the whole to rise. And a, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships, you know. I mean, it's like the whole world has been made better everywhere the kingdom of God has been preached and embraced. That's why Western civilization differs from India or, or China uh, or you know, tribal Africa. I mean, these, these cultures that have not embraced or been changed by the kingdom of God, you, you wouldn't want to live there after you've lived somewhere like this. You know, I mean, uh, society has been transformed by the kingdom of God. And when we pray your kingdom come, it, it just means it's, it's continually coming. The leaven is continually spreading and, continu and continually impacting. I think that's what we're praying for until finally every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's when it, we don't have to pray for any more of it. You know, it's, it's universal at that point. So that's how I understand that. Go ahead. Yeah. I got a, a question.
question and a, I guess, a confirmation. Um, in Mark chapter 9, when Jesus, uh, was right before he was transfigured, and he's talking to um, the people, and he says, Surely I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit right there, right? That is certainly one of the best explanations of it. There are some other possibilities, but that is okay. certainly one of the best explanations. Of All right. time. I, I kind of was wondering on that. Yeah. Anyways, um, my second, and this is more of a question, is when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and, uh, and he said the kingdom of God is indeed close to you, mm -hmm. uh, was, what did he mean by that in particular because he was directing it towards the Pharisees? Right. Well, the kingdom, yeah, in, in the King James Version, that verse, which is Luke 17, 21, says the kingdom of God is within you. You know, yes. yeah, the, yes. King, the King James says uh, it doesn't come. You won't say low here. It doesn't come with observation. It's, it's within you. And that. He's talking about general? Well, yeah, or, here's the thing. When many people have taken the King James rendering and made it say, he's talking about something internal. The kingdom of God is an internal, uh, you know, awareness or, you know, surrender to God or something like that. But you're right. He wasn't talking to obedient disciples. He's, he's talking to the Pharisees who were his critics. So he, it certainly wasn't in them. Yeah. But uh, the word within you, uh, as every new translation, including the New King James, there's, I don't think the King James has uh, any other translation that agrees with that translation. Uh, the same word can mean in the midst of you. That is within the group, not within you as individuals, but within this crowd here, within you, or within you plural, within this group, uh, or, or more properly, among you or in your midst. This is uh, almost every, as far as I know, every new translation translates it either the kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is in your midst, which, as I said, the kingdom of God is a society of a king and his subjects. And there was Jesus, the king, right there. And in the crowd, some of them were the, his disciples. Yeah. So the kingdom okay. was already infiltrating that, that lump of dough right there as leaven. It was within them in that sense. So he's not talking about it within an individual, though we, we would not deny that the persons who are in the kingdom of God also have an internal you know, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But... But the kingdom is not primarily a focus on what's going on inside an individual, but what's going on in the global claims of Christ being pressed upon the rebellious world in the warfare against the kingdom of Satan. Um, of course, there's a great deal of emphasis in the Bible on what's in your heart, too. But the kingdom of God is not primarily uh, defined as what's going on inside of me. It's more like, what am I inside of? I'm inside. The, I'm in the kingdom. I enter the kingdom. It doesn't enter me per se. I have to enter it. It's a larger society of, of followers of Christ worldwide is the kingdom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Jason. I've been reading your uh, teaching in, in, in Proverbs. So as we're talking about the kingdom of God, uh, how would we as within the kingdom of God here apply Proverbs to our to our lives. To our lives in, in the kingdom. Okay. Yes. How would, in the New Testament realization of the kingdom and our participation, how would Proverbs apply to our lives? How would we actualize and, and, and respond to the Proverbs? Um, well, the Bible says, in Colossians, Paul says, do not be unwise, but knowing what the will of the Lord is. Uh, being wise is very important. In fact, James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and it'll be given to him. Uh, Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, said, he that hears these words of mine and obeys them is a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And he who hears my words and does not obey them is like a foolish man who builds his house. See, wisdom, true wisdom, is following Christ. But Proverbs and a few other Old Testament books like Ecclesiastes are, and Job, are what we call wisdom literature. They're, it's actually a genre of Hebrew writing where uh, wise men like Solomon, uh, mostly Solomon more than any other, would write uh, Proverbs and, and other instructions, in the case of Proverbs, usually to his son, uh, about wisdom. He says, seek wisdom. Whatever you seek, 
above all things, seek wisdom, you know, cherish it as the apple of your eye. He compares wisdom like a beautiful, desirable woman that you want to court. You, you know, she speaks to you and calls to you and, and says, you know, I mean, there's uh, the first uh, eight chapters, especially of Proverbs, are personifying wisdom as a desirable woman and in contrast to the, the, the boisterous woman who's trying to seduce you the other direction and so forth. Foolishness is like a harlot. A wisdom is like a desirable woman. And, and then the Proverbs themselves, after about chapter 8, are mainly just individual aphorisms about wisdom. Now, we should be wise. And wisdom is wisdom. Now, we have to understand what the Proverbs are and wisdom literature in general. Wisdom literature is different than, say, the Torah laws. It's different than the prophets, which are, you know, predict things. There are no, technically, Proverbs are not promises, nor specifically commands. They are illumination about what wisdom would demand. And of course, it's a given. You want to do the wise thing, not the stupid thing. So what Proverbs does, it, it examines tendencies and causes and effects and says, let me just define wisdom first of all. Wisdom is knowing what is the desirable end and knowing what steps from where you are you should take to get there. So if you want to, uh, uh, you know, you want to be a, a great surgeon and, and discover a cure for cancer, what well, probably you want to take some steps of getting an ed a medical education, you know. Uh, I mean, there might be other ways to discover a cure for cancer, but in all likelihood, you'll probably get a scientific ed education. You, you might get a scientific education and never find a cure for cancer, or you might not get an education and find a cure for cancer, but if you, are, if you don't know the outcome, but you know the outcome you want, there are certain steps you would take that would be wise that would tend toward the result you're seeking, whereas other steps would not. So Proverbs assumes most people would like to be rich rather than poor. So he says, you know, work hard. The diligent man, you know, he'll have abundance. But the, you know, the, the sluggard, you know, he'll be in want and he'll be begging and so forth. Now, that's not always true. A sluggard might win the lottery. And a very diligent man might live in a third world country where no matter how hard you work, you're going to be poor. I mean, it's not a promise of God. It's not one of the promises of God. And it's not a prediction per se. It's, it's a, uh, generalities that would direct a person in the steps of wise conduct, given the idea that they have a certain desired uh, result they're seeking for. So you want your kids to be good people. So discipline them. And the rod will drive the wickedness out of them, usually. You know, train up your children in the way they shall go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Normally. I mean, he's not, these are not promises. There are people who do discipline their children and train them up well, and their kids don't turn out as good as they hoped. So, you know, the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Well, not always. But if you want to, if someone's angry at you and you want to stop them from being angry, answer softly rather than being aggravating in your words. It's a wise thing to do. It won't always guarantee the result, but it'd be stupid if you want that result to do anything else. So the idea is don't do stupid things, do wise things. There's no guarantee that being wise will give you the results that you hope, but it's certainly the most intelligent way to pursue them. So, um, you know, uh, if you want to uh, calm down somebody who's angry at you, speak gently and calmly and politely to them. It's more likely than not going to calm them down. If it doesn't, then it's an abnormal situation, but, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen that way. If you, if you want to get rich, work hard. Don't be a sluggard. Now, a sluggard might get rich if he inherits a fortune from his, you know, uncle, but generally speaking, sluggards are poor and remain poor. So the, basically, Proverbs is wisdom literature, and the Jews loved wisdom literature. They wrote several apocryphal books of wisdom literature, too, the, you know, the wisdom of Syrac and so forth. But um, they did not intend for them to be promises of God. So when someone says, well, train up a child the way he go, when he's old, he will not depart from it, so I, I, I can guarantee my kids will follow Christ. And I kind of thought that way, too, at one time. But, but the truth is, I've seen too many cases where it's not true, including uh, some godly people in the Bible, like Samuel, whose children went bad. 
Um, children have their own free will. But if you, the best chance you have of having your children turn out well and not depart from the ways of righteousness is instill them as early as you can. That's the idea. Give them a good start. Um, so Proverbs, I, I think Proverbs is applicable to all life at all times. It's not strictly speaking an Old Testament ethic. It's, uh, it's basically wisdom is wisdom. I mean, do you want to uh, get home safely? Uh, drive on the right side of the road and try to stay pretty close to the speed limit. That's wisdom. You might still get hit by a drunk driver and die, but if you'd like to get there safely, you're not very wise to be driving on the wrong side of the road and uh, weaving around the road and so forth. I mean, there's, there are things you do that would tend toward the result you want, and it would be only a foolish person who would want that result and not do those things. That's what wisdom literature is basically talking about. Would it be good to, when we're just reading scripture in general, try to glean, is this a principle or a promise? Yeah, and the difference between exactly. those two would be very helpful. Yeah, we sometimes just think, oh, it's in the Bible, it's the word of God, it must be a promise of God. But we have to understand the genre of the literature. Uh, uh, sort of like people say, well, you know, I, I know Revelation's literally true because... You know, God said, he says what he means, you know. Well, he does say what he means. If we don't understand the type of literature he was using, we won't know what he's even saying, much less what he means, you know. It's not so simple as to say, I'm an American, I read this like an American written book, and I'm going to apply it like a, an American would read a, a, an American book. No, it's a, it's a Jewish book. It's a Jewish book that's very ancient and, and from a culture that had certain presuppositions. And the way we understand it is to get as much as possible into under the skin of the people who wrote it and into whom it was written and some people say well then you know shouldn't uh, shouldn't the bible be understandable to a child well much of it would be most of it would be to a jewish child but i'm not a jew and i didn't i wasn't raised in that culture i didn't even speak the language i can't even read it in its original language a jewish child when he's a certain age could read it in hebrew i can't i have to go to school to learn that a greek child would know would speak fluent greek by the time he's probably four or five years old, I'd have to go to college for that many years to learn fluent Greek. You know, I mean, we have to study just to get to the cultural place that every uneducated person at that time already was. What they took for granted, we don't take for granted until we study their culture and their language and so forth. And that's, so, uh, I mean, people can be very simplistic about the Bible, and I think God sometimes honors that, you know. People who don't have a Bible education, they just see something in the Bible and the Holy Spirit quickens that verse to them and they just take that as a promise and, and, and it actually is a promise God's given them. But anyone who studied the Bible as it was intended to be understood would realize uh, they're a little naive, they're not taking it right, but God's honoring their faith anyway, you know, I think. Uh, God's not a, you know, God has a lot of compassion on the humble and he's hidden things from the wise and prudent that he's revealed to babes. But... Uh, there's no virtue in being stupid about things uh, when we could understand them better with just a little bit of uh, effort, you know? Yes, Justin. All right, so my question is for someone who may not understand the difference between the two, like um, the, per the lady was asking earlier, if somebody is seeking the kingdom of God, what are they seeking and where do they search for it? Okay. Where do you seek the kingdom of God? How do you seek for it? Where do you look for it? Again, to seek something means to make that your, your object, your goal. Like uh, when a sheep was lost, the shepherd went out to recover the sheep. Uh, when the lost coin was lost, the woman swept the house until she could find and recover the coin. When we seek the kingdom... It means that our aim and our efforts are for the, uh, for the success and the promotion of the kingdom of God, uh, both in our own lives and in the world generally. Uh, certainly our, our own lives first, but not, if we get stuck on that, say I'm spending my whole life just trying to make sure I get to, that, I've, that I fit in, I qualify, uh, you're kind of wasting some of your life. You, you need to get past that first hurdle and know that I'm in, I've surrendered to Jesus. Now I need to help other people. I need to see that kingdom spread. I need to use my, uh, if, I, if I'm not a missionary, I'm not a preacher, uh, if I'm a plumber or a carpenter or a lawyer, well, at least 
I can perhaps, in a small way at my job, promote the kingdom of God by being an example, speaking to people about Christ, and even more, the money I earn, I can give to people who are preaching the word of God. I mean, th there's many ways that any vocation God calls me to, whether it's what we might usually call a secular vocation or a ministry vocation, anything we do, we do because of one object that we have that we're seeking. And that is that, that the reign of Christ would be universal, that, that Christ would be, that, that every knee would bow and confess him as Lord. And so it's like, of course, if you're called to be a preacher or missionary or something like that, a radio broadcaster like myself, then obviously your work is directly involved in trying to promote the kingdom of God and seek its, its, uh, its victories and seek its prosperity in the world. It's sometimes not as obvious when a person is, a, a, I don't know, a journalist or a, you know, an office worker in a cubicle or something like that, how it is that their work is seeking first the kingdom of God. But it's all in the matter of where your priorities are. What is it you really want your life to count for? You want, you, you want it to count for the kingdom. You want, in other words, it's different than, say, seeking wealth. If, if Jesus said, seek first wealth, well, what would that mean? It would mean that you do all you can to get rich. That you do all you, you get, a, you know, best education you can or get the best kind of job you can. That you, uh, you might even do some shady dealings to make sure your wealth increases at the expense of someone else. But Jesus didn't say to seek wealth. It's, it's what, is the, what is the goal and object of your whole existence? It's got to be the kingdom of God. And so uh, even when you're raising a family, and especially because all, almost all Christians do try to raise families, not all do, but most, well, you're raising your children to promote the kingdom of God. Your marriage, you conduct yourself in marriage toward your wife or your husband in such a way that it can promote the kingdom of God. And that, and that can very directly do so by being, especially in an age where marriages are horrible and breaking up in large numbers, for you and your wife to have a, a peaceable, godly, faithful, relationship that, you know, everyone says, whoa, how come, how come they don't have the problems we have? Well, because we are following the king. And we're, you know, our, our marriage, our life, our finances, our child raising, even our recreational time, it's all devoted to the interests of the kingdom of God. Because our goal is that the kingdom of God will prevail and that there will be no more opposition to Christ someday. And although we may not expect to live to see that day, we play our little role in it. Everything we do is chipping away at that goal. That's what seeking the kingdom means, I believe. And, and the second part is where do you search? Where do you search? Well, it's not somewhere else that you have to go there and find it. The kingdom of God is in your midst. It's here, you know. I mean, wherever Christ has been preached, there are people who have responded and who are followers of Christ. Now, of course, not everyone who has made some kind of response, maybe joined a church, many of them have no idea of serving Christ and don't even want to. But you do find wherever the gospel is preached that God's heart has touched some people and, and converted them, and they are devoted to Jesus. And, and uh, you want to be one of those, and you want to make more of those. That's seeking the kingdom of God. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere other than where you are, unless, of course, God tells you to, because being in the kingdom means he's your king. You do what he says. If he says, okay, sell everything you have and go to, you know, Pakistan and, and preach the gospel there. And I, I know people who have received calls like that. I'm not one of them, but some do. Well, then you do it. But if he says, listen, take care of this wife for me and this, these children for me, you know, raise them for my glory. Uh, bring forth much fruit for the kingdom of God in your family life or in your job or or if, you, if there's limited opportunity, just with the money you make at your job. Give as much of it as you can to the promotion of the kingdom of God where you see it being done. Um, promote justice, not social justice. Social justice is injustice. It's the opposite of biblical justice, but seek real justice because the Bible says that uh, Jesus said one of the weightiest matters of the law is justice and mercy and faithfulness. He, he, he rebuked the Pharisees. He said, you pay your tithes, that's a religious thing to do, but you neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Christians should be seeking to live justly. Remember it says in Micah, 
what he's shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, that you do justly, do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. If you're seeking justice, it means that when you see injustice, uh, as the opportunity arises, you speak against it. You do what you can to right it. You, uh, in other words, if there are unjust practices, in, even in government, although it's not our goal necessarily to bring in the kingdom through governmental action because it can't be really brought that way. But if we live for Christ, we will influence society in general, which will ultimately influence politics too. I mean, for example, if I vote, and most Christians do or should, uh, if they can, I want to, I don't want to vote for a party. I don't even want to vote for a candidate per se. I want to vote for principles. I want to quote for, I want to vote for justice. If there's, for example, if I consider that the murder of unborn babies is a horrendous injustice against them, against their rights, then I'm going to want to vote for justice. I'm going to, I'm going to see, okay, if this vote's going to get more of those babies killed or, and this other vote will get less of them killed, it's kind of, you know, I'm going for the one that's going to promote justice. Uh, if we see that certain people are uh, persecuted, some minorities or whatever, and a vote a certain way will uh, preserve their actual rights. I don't mean give them special rights, but, but preserve the rights they literally have before God. That's justice. You know, I mean, in other words, even our political involvement can be a reflection of our commitment to the values of the kingdom of God, justice especially. But... Uh, but even apart from voting, we only get to do that every four years or every two years or whatever. Every day, if we see injustice in the place we work, we see corruption, we see cheating, we see, you know, our company is doing something to defraud uh, customers or something. I mean, that's an injustice. And we might even lose our job if we speak up about it, but that's, that's just being loyal to the king. The king is against injustice. Now, of course, we have to understand there are some people who teach a sort of a social gospel that they, the only thing important is to try to get rid of uh, social injustice and, and political injustice, and that's not the gospel. But it's also not the gospel to say, well, all that matters is that we go to heaven. And it doesn't matter how bad the world gets. Uh, you know, if you try to improve it, you're just polishing the brass on a sinking ship, you know, like some people have said. You know, where's God? It says about Jesus... And this is a very good scripture for you to be aware of, and many Christians are, are not apparently aware of it, about the king, about Jesus as the king in Isaiah 42. And you'll recognize this as a verse that's quoted in the New Testament in Matthew about Jesus in his ministry. It says in the first four verses of Isaiah 42, Behold my servant, meaning Jesus, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice. To the Gentiles, he will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastline shall wait for his law. Now that doesn't sound very much like a mission to get people to go to heaven particularly. It sounds like his mission is to establish justice among the Gentiles, to establish justice in the earth. The kingdom of God is going to be concerned about the weightier matters, of which the first Jesus said is justice. So justice in our dealings with each other, making sure I'm not cheating someone, making sure I'm not exploiting someone or oppressing somebody, making sure I'm not, uh, you know, in a little, little way, uh, giving myself an advantage that I don't deserve in a situation and at the expense of someone else. That's injustice. Just living a life, again, what you would that men would do to you, do that to them. That's the whole law and the prophet. So if I'm doing something that's, a, you know, at, to the disadvantage of someone else, that, that's unjust, I wouldn't want them doing that to me. I need to stop doing that. And if I see someone else doing it to some innocent victim, if I were that victim, I'd want someone else to speak up and, and address it. So... I should do so if, that's, if I have the opportunity. I mean, we don't have to go out scolding everyone we see doing things wrong. We'd lose our voice very quickly um, and probably not change as much as we hope. But there are times when God would move you to speak about that. And you shouldn't think, ah, that's not really about heaven. That's about kind of worldly you know, laws or whatever. Well, worldly laws are where justice 
is in, is is enforced or not, you know. Uh, and I said that social justice is not justice, it's injustice. And it's very simple to see how social justice is about group rights. True justice is about human rights, individual rights. For example, social justice identifies certain groups as disadvantaged. And they might be a racial group or a gender identity group, or they might be an economic group, the poor. Uh, and, and then there's others, of course, straight white males, <laughs> who are the advantaged group, and they have to be punished so that this other group can be helped. That's what reparations is about. You know, all the white people are guilty for slavery, even though most of us never had it, or none of us ever had a slave, and most of us were not descended from people who owned slaves. But we're guilty just because we're in the group, and therefore we should be punished, and, and people who are in another group, some of their ancestors did suffer injustice at the hands of some white people, but these people didn't, and and most of their ancestors really didn't either because they came to this country after slavery was abolished. Well, they, they somehow are supposed to be rewarded because of their group. The Bible's totally against that. God in the law did not allow Israel to favor their own just cause over that of Gentiles who lived in their midst. They were supposed to be equally just to the foreigner in their midst, just as they had been in Egypt foreigners and they were supposed to, you know, be compassionate and, and just to the foreigners. Even though the Israelites had a history of slavery, they'd been in slavery for centuries, but a later generation that had never been slaves, they weren't given special treatment in court because they had ancestors who were slaves. In fact, the law specifically says, you shall not favor a rich man in his cause in court, but two verses later it says you shall not favor a poor man. In other words, economic groups, racial groups, certainly gender groups, are not supposed to be as a group judged. Justice in the Bible is colorblind. It's gender blind. Every person has responsibilities and rights, whether they're man, woman, uh, minority, majority status, even if they're homosexuals, they have human rights. And, uh, and we should not say, well, I don't like, uh, you know, people of such and such a race, or I don't like, you know, women, or I don't like, you know, uh, whatever group, and therefore I'm not going to treat them right. That's, that's what social justice is about, but that's, not real, that's injustice. It means that if I'm innocent, I may be punished for what someone else did, an ancestor of mine. But in, it says in Ezekiel 18, a father shall not be punished for his son's sins, and a son will not be punished for his father's sins. The soul that sins is the one that's going to be punished. Punishment belongs to the person for their own individual responsibility. And if, for example, all the people who make a certain amount of money are going to be punished so that they can redistribute the advantages to people who are below a certain income level, that might sound very charitable, but it's not just because the person who's having the money taken from them might have justly earned it by working their brains out. Whereas the person who's been given that money that they didn't earn might be someone who sits around, plays video games, and smokes pot all day. But, I mean, that may be why they're poor. You, you just can't say this economic group should be punished to help this group or racial group or whatever. The fact that, you know, some, certainly black people at one time in this country were very much oppressed, obviously, and that's a terrible thing, and it's been redressed. It's been redressed by law and by war. But uh, the fact that some black people still are kind of stuck in ghettos and places like that, uh, well, it's, it's a very sad thing, and I'm not making light of it, but... Ben Carson was raised in the projects by a poor single mother, and he got an education. He got out of the hood, you know, and he uh, became a surgeon and then an influential man in government. So, I mean, the fact that a person, a woman, a homosexual, a, a black or Hispanic person or someone else that's considered to be maybe in a disadvantaged group in some way can get out of there if they want to, means that uh, people's destiny lies a lot more in their effort and, and what they choose than in some kind of fate they have by being part of a group. Um, I mean, should we give reparations to all the Japanese because in World War II we put them in camps? That wasn't a very nice thing to do. It was a very, a very tragic thing to do. But I don't hear the Japanese saying, okay, because of that, my, my, my grandmother was in a internment camp, so you owe me money. 
Well, they, I think they know better. I think they know that it was a bad thing, maybe even an unjust thing. But it had nothing directly to do with them or me. You know, it's justice meets out individual rewards commensurate to individual responsible acts of individuals. And if you, if you, you know, punish a whole family or a whole race for the individual's actions, that's not justice. And so that's why social justice is really not justice. It's Marxism and it's, uh, it's class warfare is what it is, which is what Marx taught. So anyway, being just, being merciful, being faithful, being loving, those are the things that, that's how you seek to promote the kingdom of God. Any, any questions inside? We got one last question online. Uh, Doug from Kansas asked, this is not a kingdom of God question, but a general question. Uh, he says, I've been listening to your Christian character series, and it, it has caused me to think through what it might be like to have a calloused conscience. The question in my mind was if one's heart becomes hard or conscience hardened, would the person recognize they're in that condition? The answer that comes to me is that person might go for days never feeling or recognizing sin in their life that needs to be repented of. Well, your heart can harden. We have to realize that our character, our inner man, our spiritual being is not static. It is dynamic. It gets better or it gets worse, but it doesn't just stay the same by default. If you do not work at overcoming sin in your life, sin will work at overcoming you in your life and you'll become more and more in bondage to it. Uh, we have to cultivate character by trust in God, by prayer, by obedience, by you know, basically doing what Christians are supposed to do but, and waging a warfare against uh, our, our lusts, that wage war against the soul, Peter said. But if we don't do that, if we just float, it gets worse. Now, it gets worse especially if God is convicting us of something we do and we ignore the conviction. Our heart becomes, our conscience becomes more numb. And it's very common for people to feel very guilty about something they do initially, but as they don't, as they ignore the conviction and keep doing it, the conviction goes away. They, 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 they become callous. Just like when you learn to play guitar, you injure the, your fingertips and you might say, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Or if you keep playing the guitar, the calluses grow and you don't feel the same thing. You're still doing the same kind of, you're afflicting your fingers the same way, but the feeling is gone. And um, leprosy is a disease that you know, causes people to lose body parts, but it doesn't eat those body parts away. Leprosy makes it impossible to feel pain in their appendages, which means that where we're favoring our hands all the time, like the other night, my wife, was walking into someone's house and didn't know there was kind of a brick step there and she kicked it hard, broke, didn't break her toe, but she did some damage. I mean, we do that kind of thing all the time, but because it happens when we feel the pain, we say, oh, I'm gonna correct that, I'm not gonna keep doing that. But if you felt no pain, you could destroy yourself before you knew it. I mean, if you put your hand on a fire and you didn't know you'd done it, pain is a good thing. It lets you know, hey, that's, you gotta stop doing that. When you lose sensation, when you lose con the ability to feel conviction, your heart has become calloused or hard. Now, he said, uh, if your heart is grown hard, would you know it? Well, I'm sure some people would not. The very hardness of heart is a feature that makes you unaware of the condition of your heart. Um, and there are people that are apparently given over to a reprobate mind that Paul talks about, which apparently refers to someone like we'd call a sociopath. They don't have any conscience left. They don't know right from wrong or care about it. They have no sense. Now, a person gets to that point, I don't know how they'd be redeemed unless it was through the miraculous answers to, of the prayers of their friends and family. They might, you know, God could break through the hard heart. But this makes it so urgent that we attend to our heart. You know, it says in Proverbs 4, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You can't just neglect your heart. Keep it like a garden. Keep it from the, the bugs and the weeds and things like that because it's vulnerable. If you don't attend to the garden, it's going to be overrun with weeds and bugs. You're going to lose, lose what you had. Uh, the heart's that way too. Maintain it. Keep it. Uh, keep short accounts with God. When you feel conviction, repent. If you don't repent, 
you'll feel less conviction. That doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. It means you're losing touch with what the right thing is and you become more endangered. But um, yeah, I do believe people can get to the point where they will never again feel the conviction they need to feel, which is prerequisite to their conviction and repentance. But, um, but sometimes people seem very hard and God gets through to them anyway. And that's probably through the prayers of their mothers or their fathers or friends or somebody because uh, I think that once a per the harder you get, the harder it is for you even to know your heart because you're losing touch. You're losing, you're losing sensitivity about things. So this may be a good, good way to close. Uh, Lori asked, uh, or she mentions other authors or speakers on this subject, I'm assuming the kingdom of God that you recommend. After the last time you visited, I read some works by Michael Heiser who had similar views. So, uh, so on this subject, who might we read in tandem? Well, Michael Heiser, I, I honestly don't know his views about the kingdom. I know he writes about the unseen realm. He writes about demons and angels. And of course, that all has reference to the kingdom. Um, I mean, his emphasis seems, to my mind, to be elsewhere than on specifically the kingdom. But what he does believe and say about the kingdom might be very close to what I'm saying. Because, frankly, a lot of, a lot of good writers are giving more thought than they used to to the kingdom of God. People like N.T. Wright... And, uh, and, quite, and lesser known people too. Uh, I, I can't just say I recommend whatever this man or that man says about the kingdom. Uh, when you read my book, if you get around to read my book on the kingdom, that's, you'll see that I quote these people and I critique them. I either say this is right, what they're saying, and biblical, or this part of what they said is, I think they're missing it a little bit. So uh, there are many authors. Uh, George Eldon Ladd in his book, The Gospel of the Kingdom was a very popular one for a long time, and, and uh, actually, you know, he's pretty good on it, but he, uh, there are some things that, as a historic premillennialist, I think he's seen differently than I would. Um, so I can't really say there's a book on the kingdom of God or an author that says exactly everything that I would recommend, but a lot of them come pretty close. I really like a book called The Kingdom of God by a guy named John Bright. Now, the interesting thing, he was, this is, he wrote it, you know, a generation ago, um, and it was a very, uh, very well-known book. He wrote an excellent book. He himself was a little bit more liberal than I am as a Christian. I mean, he, it sounded like he wasn't so sure Isaiah wrote the whole book of Isaiah, for example, which I'm, I'm sure Isaiah did. But uh, I think he was maybe in a more liberal school, but you wouldn't necessarily know it reading this book. He, he, he goes through the Old Testament and develops the idea of the kingdom of God in tedious detail. I, I loved the book. He had so much helpful historical information about, you know, Israel and the, and the nations around it at the time. He's just brilliant. Um, and and uh, frankly, I recommended this book to somebody, and they wrote to me and said, I started reading it. I'm not really feeling it, you know. And I have to say about his book, it's a very scholarly and informative book, and the first three quarters of the book, anyway, is going through Israel's history in a lot of detail, which I appreciate, but maybe not everyone would. But when he gets to the latter chapters where Jesus is now introduced in Jesus' gospel and his, what he established, he's right on the money. It's a very, very good book. It's called The Kingdom of God by John Bright. I think it was written in 1953, if I'm not mistaken. But there's a lot of authors who come awfully close to what I would agree with. I mean, it's, it's not a new idea. What I'm teaching is not a new idea. It's just not the prevalent idea that's taught in evangelical American um, preaching at this present time. And I think that's largely because of the influence of dispensationalism. The uh, evangelical churches of America have been very thoroughly uh, in influenced by dispensationalism, which has obviously this idea that the, po the kingdom was postponed, you know, until Jesus comes back, which is very different from what the Bible says and, and quite, uh, to my mind, fairly misleading. So I can't just recommend one author. I, I, I do quote a lot of authors in my book. But uh, obviously, since I'm, everyone thinks their views are, you know, right, I could recommend my books, but they're not quite out yet except by Kindle at this moment. Mm, thank you. Thank you, uh -huh. Awesome, awesome. Wow, he is taller than me. Bring this down here. So uh, uh, just... Just to kind of 
uh, let you know why I specifically wanted Steve to talk on this topic is uh, for what he just mentioned right there. I think the, the church has greatly been misinformed about the kingdom of God and its present state and how we need to be kingdom aware and uh, to draw a distinction like Steve did but between what I believe and what Steve talked about tonight, the distinction between that and some really charismatic, we are bringing in a uh, kingdom of God now, and it's a very man-glorying type uh, teaching. It's not that at all. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's a man subject to God uh, mentality and approach that we really need to to embrace to honor our king and so as a pastor I feel a a deep responsibility the very responsibility that Steve uh, mentioned whenever Jesus said what he intended for us to do was to preach the kingdom and so I know that the Lord is is leading me to better understand that so I can be a more faithful subject to my king as a pastor serving under my king and make sure that that I am uh, representing him as a king and and the expectation that we would be subjects to this king and that we would bow our knee to him and and our hearts to him and loyal service to him and so uh, he's a majestic king ain't he though he's beautiful and he's worthy he's worthy of that and uh, you know we think of of kings as we've learned and grew up you know, watching movies and how they honored the king and the king was to be to be revered and you you approach the king as someone that's just higher than you and all that and that goes against man and his pride and and so if we deliver a gospel that's absent of that, people will devour it up. Say, yeah, I like that. But if we're going to be faithful in, in the gospel of the kingdom, it's one that says, bow your knee because your king's here. And so uh, uh, thank you, Steve, for sharing that. I'm excited. Uh, I got a, a, a copy of uh, the first book, and uh, I know I'll be getting a copy of the second book. I'm excited uh, about reading that. In the meantime, uh, I do encourage you to go to thenarrowpath.com and uh, check out uh, the thousands of lectures and and um, expositional teaching line by line through the Bible, um, various uh, uh, topical messages, and I enjoy the debates. Uh, some of those you can catch on YouTube, but they're they're all on the uh, uh, the Narrow Path website, and also one I use probably the most is the Narrow Path app. So uh, go on your Safari or your uh, the App Store and the iPad or the iPhone, iPad, any of those. And I believe you can also get it on the Android, correct, Steve? You, yeah, you, yeah, for a while it was different. And I had been from, from it's a different app. Both of them have the same content. Awesome. Good. So I, I encourage that. So uh, uh, for those of you that have commutes, um, I know uh, my brother Justin was talking about, and I've, I've done it myself. I, I, uh, I listen during the commute. Uh, if, if you have your list of those that you like to listen online, you might consider listening to uh, The Narrow Path also. I believe it is of the Lord. So thank you, Steve, for sharing tonight. And uh, we, uh, Steve is on a very tight schedule. Uh, praise the Lord. The, the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few. And so, although I know we would have loved to have spent more time with Steve, uh, the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few. And so the Lord sometimes has to spread his laborers out. Um, and we, we uh, don't get to spend as much time as we would like to together. And that's why I mentioned to Steve, if nothing else, we got all eternity. Uh, but we want to spend some time down here together also. So uh, keep uh, uh, Steve and uh, Dana in, in your prayers. Uh, your grandson also who's traveling with them. Uh, and they, as they've got quite a few miles left on the road that they're going to be putting on. And so uh, just pray that the Lord would uh, protect them, get them to where they need to be. And even if a fog was to settle in, oh, like oh, uh, uh, George Mueller, you know the story uh, uh, of the ship. Uh, the, the Lord can lift the fog to make sure you get to your appointments. And, and we'll be praying for your safety and the efficiency of your trips. Father, we thank you for this time and uh, this time in your word. Uh, we love your word. 
Um, it is such a beautiful gift that you left to us uh, to be able to seek you and to know you. But it's the gift of your Holy Spirit that enlightens us and instructs us. And we thank you for that personal tutor that you would say to us, I want you to know me. And I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to us, specifically as we've requested tonight in our hearts to better know our King. And I pray that you would truly reveal yourself to us as individuals, that we would know your King so we could be better subjects to our King. In Jesus' name, amen.